Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Mixed Reality Speaker Series. Uh, so today we have a really cool presentation. I have with me a whole bunch of wonderful people from Unity, and they're going to be talking about Pixies, uh, as well as some visual scripting, and this is going to be cool. I think you're going to enjoy it. So I'm going to pass this over to the team so that they can introduce themselves, and then uh, we're going to get into the presentation. We're doing it live. He's got a nice demo, and um, while you're watching the presentation, think of some questions. We do have a little Q&A box, and we will be answering your questions live after the presentation. So uh, think of your questions, put them in, and uh, I'm going to hand this over to Dorothy. She's going to kick off the introductions here, and we'll go down the line. There's a, a, a couple of them here that uh, we're going to introduce. So uh, Dorothy, over to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Unity um, Unity Workflow Productivity Pixies Plugin and Visual Scripting Workshop. What we really want to do is have a really fun, interactive um, time with you today. And thank you for joining. Um, we look forward to your questions. All right, and over to Jason. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason, uh, Manager of Solutions Engineering here at Unity. Uh, I'll be mostly helping in the Q&A section. So yeah, while uh, Jerome's giving an amazing presentation here in a minute, uh, just Pop some questions. I'll see if we can help triage some of those, get you some answers. Thanks. Go ahead, Thank Phil. Phil. Hey, folks. Um, excited to uh, be with you all this morning. Um, I'm Phil. Uh, I lead um, our product management uh, for our core um, AR, VR, and MR uh, developer platform uh, here at Unity. All right. And now the floor is yours, Jerome. All right. Thank you. And that's okay. I'm going to grab the share for my slides. There we go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to look at improving workflows and collaboration using Unity Pro, Pixies plugin, and both visual scripting specifically for mixed reality projects. Right. So my name is Jérôme Moret Delaunay. Salut tout le monde. I am a uh, senior technical specialist here at Unity on the industrial team. I'm based in the UK, in London. I've been a Unity developer since 2009 about, where I started doing mobile application and quickly moved into the XR space, uh, developing um, for things like the Gear VR, um, the early iteration of the HTC Vive, and of course the HoloLens, um, which we got really early in order to do explorations and demos. And I've been at Unity since 2018. I joined as the uh, XR solution engineer in Europe, uh, again, focusing on XR use cases in the industrial space, and I'm now a technical specialist, so more focused on outreach to the community. You have my details here, email, Twitter, and LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is usually where I post a lot of uh, hopefully interesting features and information for the community around using uh, Unity in the uh, industrial space. So today, some of the elements that we're going to look at are part of what we call the Unity Industrial Collection. This is kind of like our cornerstone offering for uh, our industrial customers. So you know, if you do games, Unity Pro is perfect. But unfortunately, when you work in industrial, uh, in the industrial space, sorry, um, the formats, the workflows, and the tooling that is required is quite different. And this is why we bundle Unity Pro the Pixies plugin, which is based a CAD importing solution and our material importer. And we're going to deep dive quickly on each of those solutions. The first one is Unity Pro. I'm assuming if you're here, you have a good idea of what is Unity. If you don't, Unity is basically a content creation platform. At its core, it's been used extensively in game. You can think of, you know, uh, over half of the top 1000 mobile games are made with Unity, over half of the uh, um, Switch games are made with Unity, so quite a very popular platform when it comes to uh, games, but I extend also to content creation in XR on HoloLens, for example. It is the leading platform for content creations for the HoloLens uh, specifically. And this is the editor uh, where you base import your assets, create your behavior, assemble your scenes, export and package your application or your assets and, and um, have a unified workflow for content creation and that to drive real time 3D. Then on top of this, we have the Pixies plugin. So this is specifically to uh, data process um, 
industrial formats like JT, PLM XML, um, uh, even a BIM format like Revit, for example, right? Uh, but also FBX because you can do a lot of manipulation on the data set when you import files inside Unity that are not supported out of the box by the Unity editor. What do I mean by this? Well, you can import and optimize uh, your tessellation, your mesh, right? You can um, modify the hierarchy, for example, so simplify um, the uh, object tree in order to remove intermediary nodes, for example, or to merge elements together based on their material, just to drive a little bit of in, um, optimization. You can repair meshes that may have like, you know, dodgy normals, for example. You can create UVs and you can apply rules. Pixies also support point clouds, so I have here a little box that shows you what you can do with the point clouds and we'll cover some of the features like the highlight feature in the following slides. The first one I want to uh, drive is the level of detail. They have a non-destructive level of detail workflow, which is post-import, so you can decide basically a level of detail strategy based on what you're trying to uh, publish to. So for the HoloLens, for example, you're going to do some heavy uh, dissemination to reduce the density of a mesh, but if you're doing you know, something with real-time ray tracing and on a 3090 NVIDIA, car, then you, you know, uh, kind of can uh, avoid all of these. You can also create custom colliders, which is really useful, especially with objects that have holes, for example, where you can use a convex decomposition to create multiple colliders to account for those holes or uh, perforated surfaces, and you can apply rules. This is what we're going to be covering inside the editor in a minute. Uh, point clouds, as I mentioned, uh, E57, PTS, PTX, and a uh, link to recap. Note that recap requires a license to work, but you can import your point cloud directly inside the Unity editor, and you can also optimize a lot that data Thanks to a few uh, point cloud features, which are quite brilliant, you can do segmentation. So this is very useful, especially in VR, for example, or on the HoloLens even, if you want to visualize point clouds, is you can break down point clouds into logical uh, chunks, right? Um, meaning that every chunk that is not visible currently can be called and not rendered by the Unity engine, saving you a lot of performance. Keeping in mind that if you have a million points and just two of those points or one of those points is visible, you need to push that million point to the GPU, right? Or at least account for it in your Calls. So that's really costly. So doing segmentation, which is basically a little slider in the import box for point cloud is super useful. You can do point cloud level of details. So that's um, generating the same level of details you would have for a mesh, but for point cloud, and you can see here on the little door, uh, what that means is when the door is far away, you know, it's a 90% reduction of the um, amount of vertices, so quite optimized, and you can do, uh, you can mesh, tessellate your point cloud, including creating uh, colliders, so that you can interact with the point cloud. Last one is a bit more obscure if you're not in the industrial space, but that's material importer. There are standard materials uh, for industrials, which are scanned materials spe using specific hardware like AXF and XTEX. So these are the material format that they use and they have machines to scan physical material in order to create a digital representation. And you can now import those inside the Unity high definition render pipeline um, in order to use them directly out of the box, right? And then, Recently, we acquired uh, Bolt Visual Scripting. So this was a community asset developed and uh, beloved by uh, a lot of members of our community that allows you to script visually without having to write C-sharp code. Um, being one of the most popular and best solution out there, rather than reinvent the wheel, we decided to acquire them and they're now fully integrated inside the Unity pipeline. So visual scripting, basically it's free for all the users. You just uh, download it from the package, from the asset store, sorry. If you are using 2020, Unity 2021.1, uh, and before, and if you are using Unity 2022.2 and after, then it's already included with the editor as a, a package. So it's been um, moved uh, essentially. Um, it's really easy to create logic. You can see here, connect a few nodes and then you get behaviors um, and uh, you can access pretty much any C Sharp API available in your project uh, to use. For example, the car at the bottom of the slide here is from our uh, solution Unity Forma. So it's a Forma model that comes with variants, right? Uh, options, permutation of materials, for example, in this case, or lights that you can turn on and off. And using a simple C sharp um, layer, I was able to create, you know, a UI using Bolt uh, in order to connect the two. Right. That means from there on, once you have that interface, people, artists can work uh, and create uh, interactivity without having to write any code. And then uh, finally, why use Bolt? One of my favorite things is you can actually script while in play mode, so it's super cool for experimentation. Uh, then it's, you know. 
accessible for non-programmer, but it's also very convenient because you can empower non-programmers with, like I said, C# -sharp APIs, for example, custom nodes or you know uh, super nodes, which are like you know I will show you uh, an example of super node in the presentation. All right, and the mixed reality toolkits. Again, if you're here, you're probably aware of Hololens. Uh, you know, it will always be the uh, uh, Holo toolkit for me when we started working with the early iterations. It used to be called Holo toolkit, and then was renamed to the mixed reality toolkit. So I've been using this toolkit for quite a while. I have to commend the team. I've met some of the members in London uh, before the pandemic, and it's just a brilliant toolkit. Even better now. Uh, with the integration of OpenXR, so getting started with your HoloLens 2 and this toolkit. Actually, it's agnostic, so you can use uh, Oculus Quest, you can use uh, obviously a Magic Leap um, and a mixed reality headset. So it's a really good toolkit, uh, comes with a ton of uh, resources, which we see some of the ones that are bundled, like you know, uh, UI um, elements, like uh, buttons, sliders, etc., objects, and tons of examples. It's a really good uh, framework, and I have to commend the team at Microsoft for putting this together. It's a Herculean uh, SDK that really makes developing for the HoloLens a lot more easier than it, than it should be. So that's brilliant. All right, enough slides. Let's dive into the presentation and switch to Unity. So give me a second. Any questions so far? Or are we good? When I do this? Uh, yeah, nothing yet. Nothing yet? All right. Well, you should see the Unity Editor now. So standard Unity Editor, I have a few um, uh, custom windows open just in case you're wondering what they are. So this is the project settings and I just have it because I need to switch between uh, using holographic remoting in play mode and not. That the reason being is if I want to use my uh, HoloLens, uh, I need to switch this on. But for now, I don't need it. This scene is not set up for uh, mixed reality. So I mentioned Pixies to import data. So I'm going to go here and select a model. Uh, this is a cat product which comes from Katia. So I'm going to open it. And here I'm presented with a custom uh, window from the uh, Pixies plugin that asks me what settings do I want to use. I preset my settings already. And what I want to do here is merge everything by material. Do a little bit of fiddling because uh, the axis between Katia and uh, Unity are different, so you need to um, account for this. Then um, I'm keeping the tessellation or the mesh quality as it is. I'm generating UVs, it's actually not necessarily required, but I'm doing it anyway. And uh, that's it. So I'm going to import this and we're going to give it a second. So that's the first step. I should have a little hold music. Like doot, doot, doot. All right, there we go. Um, OK, so this is our CAD part that's been imported. You can see now it's, you know, tessellated. It's been merged, so we can see there's actually only uh, five parts here. I'll show you the full model later in uh, in other scenes when we need more of a, um, uh, a granular uh, model, but for now this is going to do. So what I'm going to show you now is the Pixies raw set, and this is uh, when we talk about automation and uh, tech artist friendly workflow, this is a Pixies rule, right? Um, it's you create it either here by going to a quick Pixies rule engine and then create a new rule, right? Uh, or a right clicking here in the project, same thing. Um, it's a visual workflow. So basically you add nodes and I pre prepared this one just for uh, time savings purposes. So what do I do here? I'm getting the latest importing model, which is this, right? Uh, this uh, disk break and I am getting its children without the parents. So this is a bit of a uh, uh, wonky situation is if I select this one, the whole hierarchy, it also includes the parent and I don't want to affect the parent. There's nothing there. It's just an empty game. Of, I mean, it's just a game object for holding the other parts. So I'm getting the children. Then I'm doing a little bit of uh, fiddling with the pivot points. So that's uh, really CAD specific. When you import CAD data, often the pivots will be at the center of the uh, registrations, which we're going to be zero, zero, zero. And when you're interacting with parts, you don't want that. You want normally the, the pivot point to be at, at the center of the object, right? So if you're going to manipulate with two hands, the axis that you use to manipulate is the center of the object, must be a lot more natural. And here I have a uh, custom um, action, which I created, which um, adds a flow graph, a macro 
to these to these objects, right? To all of the objects inside this um, uh, break, uh, break, and also add the collider so we can interact with it. If we don't have a collider, we can't click on it; it won't be recognized. So let's. I don't have to do anything special except to run the rule, and you can see components were added. If I look at the actual object now, I can see that a flow machine was added with my visual graph and um, a collider was added with the original mesh. Right, So I can just press play, go into game view. And if all goes well, let's pray, the, pray to the gods of live demo. There we go. I can click on this and you can see the object is changing color. Right. So this is not a super complex example. We can see the flow graph is here, for example, right? Uh, depending on the objects that I select. So we can see this one is where it happens. Right? We can see the little super unit is highlighting. I also have a, a debug mode where I place a space bar. You can see here uh, it calls uh, the random color on all the parts. So that's usually, you know, just like a normal event for the keyboard here on space up and then mouse event and um, you know just right click add a unit go to events select the type of event you want to handle and then you connect it this way i mentioned super units before what's the super unit you ask well if i full screen this a super unit is basically embedded or encapsulated code, right? Encapsulated nodes. So here I am, you know, just this is the flow. This is where the kind of like the electricity or the power runs right? Uh, for every graph. And we go, we get a random color. We get a material uh, from our render and assign it this random color and then exit, right? So that's all that it does, but that allows you to really um, keep your flow graphs concise and clean and modular so they're easier to manage and uh, uh, work with, right? So we don't have those massive spaghetti-like uh, flow graphs. And you can see that this one is actually an external flow graph. So that's why I have the prefix SU that I use. This is personal preference, nothing, uh, there's no standard um, in order to indicate that this exists externally. So when I, I can reference it from any of the other flow graphs. So let's exit this. Again, we're in play mode. Uh, funny thing is if I disconnect this here, right? You would see that when I press space bar, nothing happens because I change the flow if I disconnect again. So that's what I mean by being able to experiment with behaviors like these in play mode, right? That's something you couldn't do with C Sharp, by the way. So really useful little uh, tidbit here. All right, that was the first scene. Any questions so far? I'm gonna quickly check my notes. Yeah, sure. uh, we, have, we have one question where uh, the Pixies plugin itself, uh, can it be used in the runtime uh, such that like you do optimization on meshes in runtime or would it be edit time only? So right now it's edit time only. Um, watch this space there's going to be new products coming out for runtime but it's going to be a dedicated pipeline um, to import prepared cat data so um, yes uh, but yeah right now it's editor time only with pixies plugin um, it takes a lot of resources to uh, to process cat data so doing it at runtime uh, is not necessarily the best especially um, uh, if the user's hardware, you know, is limited in 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 capacity, right? So that's why uh, this is this is really meant for editor time, especially when it comes to cre creating LODs and and really like uh, um, uh, creating, you know, um, multiple tessellations uh, uh, scenarios. Sorry. So good question. Thank you. Uh, right, my notes are okay. I'm going to go to number two now. Don't save, I leave dangerously. There we go. So this is a uh, MRTK example, which I hijacked. Uh, and basically what I did here is, you know, how do you connect this MRTK component, which is an interactable button um, with, you know, an object um, using a flow graph, right? Using a macro. So here we have another macro. And if we look at it, it's very simple. Uh, again, I have my little debug thing. Here on start, it sets a random color, right? And then here, it's also sets a random color uh, when I click and does a little bit punch move. So it's gonna bounce a little bit just to give it a bit of pizzazz. Um, now that's great. I can handle this, but how do I get this uh, 
Unity event that I'm showing here, right, on MR Click, right? What is that coming from? Well, it comes from this button here, and I have the on click event registers to my flow machine. And I want you to look at this function here, which comes as part of the flow machine that executes the visual scripting. It's called trigger unity events, and that's what's being called here, right? This is the unity event. And then I pass it the name of the event I want to trigger, which in this case is on MR click, and that's going to then trigger this super unit and do this animation. So we can try this. I'm going to use uh, let me see, I'm not using my HoloLens for now, just for safety. And let's go to back to the flow graph, press play, and I'll use the input emulation of the mixed reality toolkit. Again, super useful. Uh, if you don't have a HoloLens, this is great to test, or even if you don't have your VR headset, uh, this is great to test. Um, so I can use ASWD to move around. I can right click to do this. I can actually maybe maximize so you guys can see better. And now, magically, I can press spacebar to bring, to bring my right hand here and then click. And you can see the object is bouncing. So I'm calling my MRTK on click uh, event and transferring it via the trigger Unity event to the flow graph. So now I can actually start creating these type of behaviors without having to do any custom C sharp uh, scripting. So super simple, right? When it comes to a button, Let's go back to here. Just find the button component that you are using. This is a prefab that's provided by the MRTK. Right? So a prefab is a reusable uh, bundle of assets and uh, behaviors. And I use the on-click event, which is when I actually um, um, do the proxy gesture, right? the pinch gesture, uh, on-click event, call this event on the little uh, object. Then that's it for that. So quite simple to connect the two again, and then from then on, you know, you can do pretty much anything you want once you have this type of uh, behaviors. Any question when I when I jump to the next scene? Uh, nothing yet. All right, and uh, in the audience, if I'm going too fast, or if you if you get lost, or if you have, you know, uh, please 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 reach out in the QA, and uh, this is you know interactive. I'm not here to just present, but this is you know. Uh, conversation. So um, make sure to uh, shout out if uh, if you miss a step or you're getting confused. All right, here for the sake of time, I just imported my disk break again uh, and it's merged by uh, material again, um, but I didn't want to uh, have you sit through this and I have, I mean, scene three. So I have a three rule set here that I created, uh, which actually, might not uh, work because I realized that I imported this after, but let's see if that works. Um, so we have the um, importing disk here, right? And I'm going to center it to uh, this position in the world, which I tested before and I like, and then I'm going to reparent it to the mixed reality scene content. And again, I highlight here with my mouse, this is part of the mixed reality toolkit. And basically what this is, is this, uh, sorry, this object here, which has basically a mixed reality scene content, and I can use this grab to manipulate the entire scene. Everything that's a child of this object, I can grab this and move it around in order to um, control it. So that's why I want to parent it there. Let me go back to my rule here. There you go. And all I do here again is, um, so parent, parent uh, the root object to this uh, game object in my scene. Then I go through the same kind of procedure, right? Get all the children recursively, center the um, uh, the pivot point on the bounding box. And again, custom action here. So the Pixies action API is obviously extensible with C Sharp. So a custom action that takes a macro right, that I'm going to assign to this object. Uh, asks for, hey, which um, even name do you want when I click this button that like we saw before? It's the same on MR click. And then, you know, um, what's the theme of your interactable uh, button? So that's kind of um, custom. This is part of the MRTK. Basically, it's a color that are going to go all the, yeah, the, the color. Uh, when you interact with the object, it changes color when you highlight, select, etc. So this is a theme and it's part of the MRTK. I'm just referencing it to pass it to, to this object. And then inside the, the script, uh, we can look at it quickly. So add interactable and more micro action. There we go. 
inside the script. All we do is um, see if we have an interactable in the uh, game object, right? Then um, I mean, sorry, add or uh, grab the interactable if there's already one. But in this case, we're going to add it. This is part of the uh, Pixies API, the get or add component, very useful to check. Then um, we add a new interactable uh, item. Uh, sorry, we set, we create an interactable profile and then we add the uh, interactable um, item, right? Uh, I mean, sets its profile in the inter interactable item. Then we add the flow machine, assign the macro, and then here, this is the one thing that I want to highlight for those who are going to uh, work with this type of in editor event assignment. So um, you, I'll show you the way to do it manually, but this is the way to do it via scripts in the editor. We are in the editor script uh, land and it's editor, uh, Unity editor events, Unity events tool, add string persistent listener. And this is how you add, let me uh, show you here inside the um, but actually, sorry, let's uh, revert. I'm going to close this for now. Go back to the inspector here. Select this action. Uh, am I here? Yeah, good, good, good. And then run. Let's see if that works. Yeah, it did. Beautiful. So as you can see, my disk has been moved. So you can see it here. It was before behind the camera, actually. Now it's in front of the camera. Uh, this hasn't changed. By the way, this bunch of information here is what we call metadata uh, that's been imported from the CAD data. This is quite important um, and I can explain why later. And here is our, let me zoom in on this. So this is one of the child objects where we apply our rule to. And you can see that an interactable component from MRTK has been added automatically. The click event has been registered to it. And then my flow machine has been added and um, a collider has been added so I can uh, grab it. So this is to actually, no, again, this is to color at random. So let's press play and then test and see what happened. Now, the beauty here is that when I import this CAD data, I can also ask Pixies to, um, to apply that rule automatically on import so I don't have to do it manually, right? So here again, there's my magic hand and you can see that, oops, it disappeared, there it goes. Uh, you can see that when I highlight, you know, objects, oh, this is way too small, let's maximize, there you go. So when I highlight object, thank you. So here I can grab my seed and move it around, right? And I can come here and when I click those objects, as you can see, right, they, I have to do the uh, the whole mass down to to do the gesture. There we go, and they actually change color briefly when I click on them. You can see. So there we go. So now, in a couple of clicks, you can basically do all of this without having any um, manual, you know, drag and dropping all those components, registering that uh, that event. And again, I'll show you again the code because this took me a little while to find originally, um, but it's super useful, right? Let me uh, wait for this to refresh. There we go. So it's this function here from the editor events, editor events tools, right? Unity events tools, sorry, and add string. You have multiple uh, options, including custom, obviously objects, if you have, uh, if you want to pass the custom class uh, to this, but there's string, there's float, uh, which and bool, which are built in by default. And then autom automatically, I would say, this gets added to this event, right? Um, so quite a useful little hack here. So, all right, so let's go to now uh, scene number four. And no, don't save. We can redo it if need be. So I'm going to close this script. Oh, no, actually, I don't have to. So here, again, for the sake of convenience, I have imported my uh, disk, uh, but this time we are going to run this action here to make it grabbable. So there's no, um, in this example, there's no visual scripting. Uh, here it's all um, pixies and um, MRTK. So the main thing that I'm doing again is I'm grabbing the root object here um, and moving it to the center, to this position in, in wall space. You can also do it to a parent or a self. Um, 
the, the self space, right? Uh, if it's uh, a parent, so there's multiple uh, reference point. Then you can also um, here is reparent. So that's a, a little action that I created in order to uh, move this object inside my scene content um, root object. And then again, center the pivot, especially when you want to grab things. And we'll see in a minute uh, how that uh, how that look. And then add a manipulation handler. So again, we're going to add the manipulation handler. And this is a MRTK uh, script, but I did create a custom what we call um, smart object, or um, in order to carry the settings, right? So for example, here I have manip manipulation start, a scriptable object, I'm sorry, that's what I wanted to say. Um, I can do everything one and only or two hands only, for example, for the, uh, for the type of manipulation. I can allow far manipulation or not, and then I can decide, depending on what I do, um, what type of um, manipulation I want, right? So rotate around the object grab point, the object center, for example. Uh, so all of these, rather than have individual values here, right in this component, which would be really long, then I create the scriptable object that takes care of passing those values to the component. Right, and we can see here, if I go to the script quickly, so add manipulation handler, right? And you can see here, all it does really is grab this um, object manipulation settings right, that I'm passing and just transfer the values to the actual component from the MRTK, right? Um, it also makes sure or adds a, um, it re checks if there's a missing collider and complains about it if there is, right? So let's go back to the game. And what I'll do now is, sorry, I need to select my, make it grabbable and then run, boom. All right, so automatically, now you've seen again, no tricks, the object has been added to, uh, to the uh, scene content object. Uh, so if you look at now the, actually I should have shown you before the pivots, but you can see the pivots have been updated. The objects have all the components. They still have their metadata, by the way, which we could use also. Uh, and let's press play and try to Go into play mode. Takes a second. There you go. So I can walk around again with spacebar. I'm gonna come here. Let's. Oh, sorry. Let me maximize on play. Make it a bit more obvious. And now I can grab my objects here and move them around. I can move the whole scene if I want to. Sorry. It's behind. There you go. Right. I can move this whole scene, uh, including move it back. Let's say. And then here, you know, I can keep grabbing stuff. Oops. Sorry about that. I need to refocus on this. There we go. So, so I want to highlight the fact that this object has a lot of parts, right? And if you were to do this manually, it would be quite a pain, right? Actually, most people have to do this manually unless if you write your own automation scripts, right? So using Pixies, especially when coming from CAD data, uh, you can do this uh, automatically. That saves a whole bunch of time uh, having done this type of operations before where you have to prepare objects. Uh, you know, it's something that you usually try someone else uh, to do for you. <laughs> for you, so you don't have to do it yourself. So um, any questions? Uh, yes, we do have one. Um, it's in regards to if you have a um, something that Bolt already created, uh, is it typically used for just mockups um, such that the engineer would then want to take it and create like C-sharp code from it? Uh, or is the intention uh, for visual scripting in the, like to be like used in the runtime um, uh, forever? And then also like what is the performance considerations of running like bolt of uh, you know uh, visual scripting in in runtimes versus just like C sharp code? Well, C sharp is always going to be faster uh, in general. So if you have really performance intensive code, then you should try to uh, use C sharp. Uh, for any sort of like event based things, you know, when uh, things run, when it's on click, for example, I think Bolt is fine. The, the overhead is minimal. Um, it really depends, you know, again, if, you, if you're doing a game loop and everything or, you know, a physics loop, you know, with a complex setup, obviously, 
you know, uh, you make heat limitation with Bolt. Um, but, you know, we're working to minimize the, the overhead of Bolt and make it as performant as possible, right? Um, and, you know, anyway, everything gets um, um, compiled, right? Uh, Cross compiled as much as possible. But there's always going to be an overhead, especially like in the initialization initializations, uh, time, et cetera. There's a lot of convenience with Bolt, you know, which costs performance. So there's a bit of a, a bit of a cost, but definitely something you want to debug. The I've seen uh, visual scripting code in production. We've seen games which use visual scripting. We've seen experiences that use uh, either Bolt visual scripting or um, other uh, plugins to do the interaction. I guess the the main thing is um, there's a few layers, right? You can create custom editor uh, UI, right, for your behaviors. So that's one thing to help designers, for example, um, in order to ease kind of the the customization of the behaviors without having to go into C sharp. Um, but it's not necessarily something they can modify. So if you have aspects of a project where you want to give the um, the less technical uh, collaborators access. To or the, the, the capability of, you know, uh, driving behaviors themselves, then visual scripting is a really good tool. Then after that, you know, essentially you have to decide whether if this is not going to perform at runtime, especially on mobile, for example, then you may need to rewrite, you know, some of the behaviors. But in an iterative stage, just the fact that you can do it at runtime uh, inside the editor, so at, at playtime, in play mode, right, is, is quite a powerful proposition, right? Um, Cool, thanks so, for a, a bit of a, you know, non-answer, I think, but yeah, it's uh, it depends on the code. Yeah. All right, well, how are we doing on time? Actually, we're doing good on time. I think I'm going a little too fast. Okay, so um, next up, we are going to go to, uh, yeah, maybe I'll save this one so we can go back to it after. All right, so we are to going to go here and I have this engine that I imported. Uh, this actually was from uh, GrabCAD. I don't know if you know this website, uh, grabcad.com. It's um, uh, it has a huge library of uh, CAD assets developed by uh, brilliant people from their community, which you know decide to share. So I tend to use them for demos like these. So this this model I used uh, a third party. Uh, tool called Pixies Studio, uh, which is the standalone uh, application to do data preparation just because it was more convenient than try to do it um, in the editor. It's a pretty complex model. Um, and I uh, manually added it to the, the scene content and created, uh, sorry, grabbed this component from the MRTK again. Like this is a uh, um, a little slider that Microsoft provides uh, in the uh, MRTK that allows you to manipulate objects using that. So you can just grab the slider and move it around. Super useful. The um, question is, hey, how do I connect these two uh, to my you know engine to do something? Right. And what we're going to do here is explode the part. So you know, uh, break it apart basically and open it up. Um, and it's it's a two step process, so this is a little bit trickier. There's one limitation in Bolt right now, which uh, got me immediately when I was trying to uh, when I started using Bolt um, a couple of years ago, and that's there's no de uh, delegate support. So what do I mean by this? Is this event here, right? I can at runtime, you know, call a bit of code and register for it. Right, so I can add my uh, my object and say like, hey, by the way, you know, send me that event to this function the same way I do here, right? Or the same way we do here. This is a C sharp script. Well, this in editor it's easy. You just press plus and add your uh, event handler. At runtime, it's not something you can do from Bolt. So you have to do it in editor time or in a separate C sharp class, right? It is doable though uh, at runtime, but it, it, it's a bit of a, a two step process, right? So here in this case, I'm going to send my slider value change event telling Bolt, uh, telling the visual script that you see here, which is a bit more, uh, sorry, complex than what we've seen before, right? There's a bit more nodes here because we're doing more complex operation and I wanted to keep everything in one graph so we could easily see it, but I should definitely uh, encapsulate some of these functions. So I want to send 
the event that the slider has changed, right? Uh, and tell the flow, the, the graph, hey, you know, do your thing, right? But in this setup, I cannot send the value of the slider, right? So right now I'm just telling it, hey, the slider has changed, but you know, how do I know this? So in this case, I have to reference the slider, right? Inside the viable component of the flow graph. So if, if every time you had a flow machine with a graph, this component gets added. It's a viable component which contains the objects viable. If we go quickly to how a graph works, you can see here we have the blackboard and there's a few tabs here. We have the graph, which is kind of like private variables that are only accessible from within the graph, not from the outside. Object variables, which are the variables that we see here on the actual game object in our scene. Then we have scene variables. So these, you would see that there's a scene variable object here. So this is where those can be defined again. Then we have application variables. So these are throughout the application lifecycle. So from start to quit, basically. And these are save variable, which are going to be persistent in between runs, right? So you have five layers of uh, scope, basically, right? From private to the graph, all the way to, you know, um, available in between runs of the application or, you know, available throughout the lifetime of the application. So you can organize your code, I mean, your variables like this. So it's super useful, uh, especially the scene object and graph, right? And here you can see that I have a few lists of uh, objects that I'm uh, using to, um, uh, grab the children of that object in order to be able to explore it. And I have a few uh, private, uh, again, lists in order to get this. And in the object, all I reference is the slider. So you can see here in my unit custom unity event, which is on slider value update, I have a sequence. So this is a, a node that lets you do multiple things. Here I do two in sequence. But first of all, I update the value of power by grabbing the uh, slider value, right? So that slider here, I'm grabbing this um, is uh, slider value viable and assigning it here. And then I'm calling this custom event, which is a way of um, dissociating basically the code. So this custom event is within the graph, right? And it's here, custom event handler. So, you know, explode parts. And this is where I do a lot of the math basically to offset the objects based on the value of the slider, right? Um, this is actually a, a, a rework of a, an open source project from Pixies. Um, it's a C-sharp class that I rewrote in visual scripting. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so if we minimize this and again, go into play, play mode, I was tinkering with this before the event, so I hope I didn't break it. <laughs> Woo, no, seems to be okay. All right, so let's get my virtual hands here. Oh, by the way, if you uh, if you're lefty, uh, what is it? It's uh, I think uh, shift. Yeah, if you want to use your left hand, you press shift here, right? And uh, there we go. And now, right, I can open this and explode it. Let me uh, maybe maximize so you can see better. There we go. So left hand, right? And with the left hand open, by the way, you can also bring your right hand right to do two hand manipulation. So quite useful, but you can see here I'm exploding this model, right? So I'm passing the value of that slider to the um, engine in order to update the flow graph here, right? So again, really um, quite simple, but you have that two step uh, process, which is kind of annoying. Uh, hopefully, in the future iteration of uh, visual scripting, you'll be able to do delegate and just register at runtime for those events. But for now, it's it's a way of doing it, um, which is not too bad. And I actually did a quick um, study working on this. That's what I was working on before the event because I realized that you know that might be useful. And again, I went to uh, uh, create a custom action, right? Why not? So I have here um, the variables that you've seen in that variable component. So let me lock this one and we can go to here. So those three variables, power, coefficient, and the slider. And here I have those values here, right? The power, the name of the variable, right? The coefficient, the value, and its name. And then the slider, I can select the slider from the scene and the name of the variable that I want to pass, right? This is the name of the variable inside the variable objects. And if we go to the actual code, 
So had pitch slider handler. So you can see all those variables here define. So maximize this for now. There we go. Uh, and then here is I add my flow machine. Keep it, remember that every time you add a flow machine to a game object, it automatically adds this viable component if it's not there. And then you have a function called, um, it's a, a static function on the viables class. You pass the object uh, where the viable component is attached to, and then you pass the string and the value. And if this doesn't exist, it adds a variable with that name and this and assigns this value. If it exists, it just updates the value, right? So I pass it my power, my coefficient, and my slider. And then again, our trusty little function here that allows me to register for that uh, on value updated, right, on the slider, and register my um, um, trigger unity event on the flow graph and pass it the value of the event name that I want to to call. Right. So that's let's unmaximize this. And that's how you get there. So you can run this on your objects and it will automatically uh, connect all the dots. I did actually on this one already. Um, and yeah, that's that. So I guess the last step, because we are short on time, is if we have questions, I'm going to go crazy now and try to test this with the holographic remoting, which gonna take me a few seconds. So any questions? Uh, yeah, just just one, which was a follow up to the prior, uh, just around performance, you know, C sharp first bullet again. Um, yeah, I guess in general, if you're a, if you're an engineer, uh, would would you should you go at it like just going into C sharp typically and kind of scripting out your own uh, state behavior, flow charts, etc., rather than going the visual way? Um, I, I think uh, I guess I could try to answer. Of course, is like you could always uh, if you have an existing like event system and everything in a Unity, uh, it's already built out in C sharp uh, and it's highly highly performant. Then yeah, I mean you could definitely use that to do any sort of um, gameplay, you know, events, uh, flow charts, you know, state machines if you have them. Uh, however, if you don't already have that stood up, uh, then Bolt is very quick to get in and get something working right out of the gate. So you're not writing that like boilerplate code to do the event systems and like drive functionality. Uh, and also, uh, if you have uh, creators that want to get in there um, that maybe don't have a deep, you know, C sharp background, then you know Bolt's going to get them in there, um, you know, much quicker than trying to make the request and explain what they need. Uh, for you to sort of architect a whole, you know, um, architecture around the thing that they're trying to do. So, uh, so you, you know, kind of depends on your use case and the, the team dynamics as well. But yeah, Jerome, feel free to add anything. I'm just uh, showing the uh, uh, remoting with the HoloLens so you can see that you can, you know, test and debug all this, which is brilliant because you can now use uh, visual scripting. Sorry, let me maybe uh, maximize this. There we go. You can now use visual scripting to quickly debug and prototype your ideas, right? Uh, but also if you have complex models like these, and again, I know Pixies is, you know, an extra cost, but if you work with any sort of data sets uh, from your customers, you know, this type of CAD data, then uh, it's really invaluable to have the convenience of all that tooling uh, baked in. So uh, FYI. But yeah, um, I think Jason, you're spot on when it comes to uh, optimization. All right, so that was it for the Unity editor, and I'm going to keep my HoloLens on because it makes me look cool. So let's jump quickly in the slide because I know we are at time for my section of the presentation. So there we go. So we dove in already. And now, yeah, QA. So if you have additional questions, uh, now is the time. I guess that's a no. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're waiting for questions so far. Yeah, but yeah, thanks for nice room. This this is awesome. Excellent. Yeah, I can uh, bring this up too to see a little bit better. Yeah, I found um, really interesting, um, and that's that's something um, I know. Uh, Phil, myself, and, and the rest of the XR team, we're also going to look at how do we um, bridge 
you know, visual scripting with the XR Interaction Toolkit, for example, which is a uh, open source toolkit developed by uh, Unity to ease, again, um, XR interactions across platforms and, and, and devices. So uh, this is going to be really a big focus. I found that using uh, Unity MRTK, for example, and, um, and, and Bolt, uh, recently we did a um, series of workshops with a customer uh, to prepare uh, 20 uh, medical engineering students for a hackathon that they were going to, um, to host. Um, and we did four hours on getting started with Unity, then four hours on using the uh, Mixed Reality Toolkit um, and Visual Scripting in order to prototype your ideas and really uh, quickly um, get to test on the device using remoting, right? not, not necessarily building, although you can build with Bolt to the device, it works fine. Um, and what was amazing is the, the hackathon itself was only five hours of, of hacking time and every single team, including people that had never used Unity before they went through our, our little workshop, uh, every single team had a working prototype, right? At the end of the, the hackathon, it was a UI UX um, exploration, right? In visualizing spatial data, I mean, visualizing 3D data, medical data. Um, and the fact that uh, all the teams, I think there was four or five teams total, uh, were able to have a physical prototype, I mean, a prototype that was uh, running, you know, via remoting on the device and being interactable was pretty impressive. So um, it says a lot about the convenience of this tooling in order to kind of, you know, remove the blockers, you know, not to have to learn C sharp, not to have to worry too much about um, uh, knowing how to script, although you do need to know the concept of scripting in order to use visual scripting, it is still scripting, so it kind of helps. Uh, but there's some brilliant tutorials already, you know, Bolt has been around for a while and there's a lot of resources to get started, right? So I think that's it for me. Maybe I'll pop up the, um, uh, again, my details right here. Um, and with technical and marketing, so we're always happy to hear from the community, especially if you have cool projects or things you want to share with us, uh, you know, to amplify, always, uh, always welcome. And then uh, I guess I'll end it to you, um, Dorothy. We have. Yeah, thank you, Jerome. That some was calls to action. That was terrific. You know, I specific, specifically like that left hand slide where everything just bursts out. Um, the, <laughs> The practical application of that is just amazing. I can think of it being used in medical and manufacturing, um, everything from you know Boeing engines or uh, manufacturing lines, even like uh, pipelines for water and oil. And I, I just it, that's just a, uh, that's one of those oh my gosh moments. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for making the time today, and we want you to get off and running with Unity as quick as possible. We've set up a email address for you, and it's um, mixed reality MR Microsoft support at unity3d.com. Since you've joined us here on the Microsoft Meetup spot, we thought it would be great to have you have your own email address so you can email us anytime. You can ask questions, you can get um, more information on learning, but more importantly, we want to hand you trial keys. We want you to get your hands on these wonderful products. So like Jerome said, if you're doing a hackathon and you want to have fun with this and you really want to build out something unique and different with your groups, we're happy to provide you trials of the Unity Pro Editor, Bolt, Pixies, and Mars. Um, let us know what you'd like. Let us know um, what your time is, how many demo units you think you might need, and we're happy to get you set up. Please also take a look at this learning portal that we've got here and the um, bit.ly's for UIC and the Success Hub. Um, there are one sheets additionally that we can provide so that you can pass them out to your um, team as you need. Any questions from anyone on materials or support? or anything else you think you might like to have or use for yeah. Unity? I'd love to add a, a roadmap note here. So um, so with Unity Mars, uh, we're um, in the process of adding so uh, meshing support to improve our HoloLens support. So uh, Mars 1.4 uh, will be coming um, imminently uh, in a matter of weeks. Um, and that'll have improved uh, support for, for meshing uh, through HoloLens, uh, as well as plain support of HoloLens. Um, so, so look out for that. Um, and you know, Jerome mentioned a few things that we're working on. 
uh, obligatory uh, product manager, um, you know, kind of a disclaimer to, um, you know, we don't have a timeline on specifically uh, DirectX 12 support, uh, hand tracking and, and visual scripting support for XRI, but those are all things that we're looking at and working on uh, right now. So, yeah. Well, back to you, I think, Nick. All right, cool. Uh, did I break it? Am I still alive? Uh, yeah, we can do. OK, all right, yeah. something happened with my interface. Anyhow, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to the event. We really appreciate having you around. Uh, thank you so much to the presenters. That was a, a really awesome presentation. Uh, I haven't actually seen Bolt in action, so that was really cool to see. Um, but anyhow, um, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> I can't. Um, all right, so it's just going to be whatever you're seeing right now for, for the rest of it. But um, yeah, thank you for coming. Um, do uh, keep an eye on the uh, meetup page. Uh, we do have additional events uh, coming up. There's one, I believe, on the 26th. Uh, so uh, watch out for that. Um, and yeah, thanks for your questions. And uh, remember to um, reach out and uh, ask about those free trials. Um, Mars is pretty cool. If you, I know we didn't really touch on that too, too much in this presentation, but uh, that's a nice, nice thing to, to grab as well. And I know I would love to, to try out Pixies for some cool things. So um, with that, thank you so much for coming and uh, take care. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Bye-bye. Are we supposed to leave? <laughs> yes, I uh, my interface disappeared, so we can all leave. <laughs> Take care, everybody, audience. And Joe, if you want to click the end button for me, that would be cool. <laughs>